Who here knows what Twitch is? Show your hands. Okay, great. Uh, more than I expected. Um, so uh, my name is Kevin Lin. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Twitch. Uh, we are a live social video site and community for gamers. Um, so the title of my talk is Live Social Video, A New Form of Entertainment. Uh, pretty literal, uh, but I was, was fearful that many people wouldn't know what Twitch is, so I thought I'd really dive in and, and, and tell you about that. So when I was talking to Sophia, um, a lot of it was thinking through what, what was our story? How did we land on what we do? Um, and then how does that translate for you folks in the audience? Uh, what, what could a producer, what is someone that thinks about creating new content um, and thinking very creatively want to know about our platform? So what is live social video? Uh, it's a video experience, a content experience, uh, where fans can really uh, interact with not only each other, but actually interact with the content creator themselves, the broadcaster. You can actually alter the content in real time uh, based on what the audience is saying or, or what they want you to do. And how big is it? So we have about 100 million people every single month that come to our site to watch video. That's a lot of people. 10 million people every day, and they're watching about two hours of content on average uh, on those days that they tune in. And 60% watch 20 hours or more per week. I mean, this is basically television on the internet. It's one of those weird things as an entrepreneur, as you, as you build something new, you don't really want to necessarily compare it to something old, but it is truly that experience. It is a participatory experience where people are congregating around something simultaneously. Uh, and it makes us very different from what you see elsewhere on the internet. Video on demand, whether it's YouTube or Netflix or otherwise, is really a singular experience when you think about it. Sure, there's some shared culture around that as videos go viral and you watch those videos and you laugh or you uh, show concern and you talk to your friends about it or you share them on, on other social media. And there is a shared experience around that, but this is a very direct uh, shared experience. And, and the folks that are experiencing, the, experiencing this are uh, millennials, it's like a you know, typical sort of marketing bucket that you very conveniently put people into, but our average age is 25, so these are folks that really are not watching television. They might be going to see movies, but they're really replacing sort of that daily habitual entertainment consumption with our website. Uh, it's bigger than most TV channels, right? That's not meant to scare you. That's just simply to say there is a large audience to be found uh, somewhere that you might not have even known about. And it's bigger than sports, so there's this whole uh, competitive gameplay uh, that's been dubbed eSports. This is sort of sports for the new, the new, the new millennium. Uh, it's around video games. It's high-skilled, highly competitive video gameplay. And people are watching more of this content than the BCS World Finals, than the NBA Finals, than, than Stanley Cup. It's, it's, it's pretty insane. Again, eSports is one of those things that many of you probably have never even heard of. Uh, it's the biggest thing you never, you, you've never seen. Uh, so very, very quick story of our, our journey, um, from Justin to Pikachu to Bob Ross. Uh, so in 2007, A Star is Born, Justin Kahn uh, was a, a friend of mine in college, uh, as were uh, two of the other founders, and uh, he, he and Emmett had founded a company called uh, Kiko, which was a calendaring software. So imagine Google Calendar, it was Ajax, it was you know, very fluid and, and real time. Uh, just the two of them, and uh, the, six months later, they decided they were pretty bored of calendar software, and Google Calendar started to pop up, so like, oh, we're going to get crushed, what do we do? So they did the natural thing and sold their company on eBay uh, for $250,000, which for two guys fresh out of college, six months of work is pretty, pretty darn good. Uh, and I think to this date, it's the only company that's been sold on eBay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, one of our founders, ladies and gentlemen. So he drives across the country. I remember this. He, I was working in, in the beverage industry um, back then. I just moved to San Francisco in 2006. And they drove across the country with, with Michael Seibel, who was an, another one of our founders, Emmett Shear, who was our CTO and, and future co-founder of, of uh, Twitch alongside myself. Um, and they sit me down. They come to, I, was, I was dog sitting for my old boss uh, up, in, up in Marin, invited them over for a barbecue. And they look me dead in the eye and say, we're starting a new company. I said, that's fantastic. What are you doing? Justin's going to broadcast his life 24-7. It's just like Truman Show. And I'm looking at them like, that idea is just the worst. <laughs> and decided, you know, I'm going to help you guys anyway. So I actually got them their first beverage sponsor. And I wasn't working for them yet, but uh, kept in touch and, and was very curious. And all of a sudden, Justin's showing up on the front page of San Francisco Chronicle. He's, he's on the Today Show talking about his experience Broadcasting his life 24-7. Turns out, uh, as crazy and interesting as Justin is, nobody is that interesting. And not only that, 
none of them were producers. No one knew how to actually craft a show. Turns out reality TV is not really reality TV. So we opened up the platform. So Justin was, did it for about six months. A lot of people wrote in and said, hey, we really want to do this too. We want to be able to express ourselves. We want to talk about what we love live. We love the live experience. Twitter wasn't good enough. YouTube wasn't good enough. We want to feel like we have a connection. We want to build that connection. We want to let people in. So we opened it up, and live casting was dubbed and, and became a thing. And I, Justine, who's, who's now um, sort of a famous YouTube celebrity, Paris Harris, who was a, um, a fashion entrepreneur, uh, were two of our earliest streamers. And by then, technology had gotten good enough that someone could just carry a Camelback with a tiny Sony Vio and a singular wireless or AT&T card plugged into it, and could realistically walk around San Francisco or any, any city streaming pretty much all day. And so technology really caught up. Um, early days, we had to build you know, a little box with four, four different eVDO cards that were terribly unreliable. So this takes off, and we get super bored. The site got really big. We managed in 2008, 2009 to survive the recession, and uh, we're starting to make money. And we got really bored. We didn't watch the site. Justin was no longer streaming. None of us were streamers. None of us are even close to that ostentatious. Um, so it made it difficult to figure out what it is that we needed to build for the product. So we did the awkward thing. We started getting really introspective and really feelings oriented and thinking about what we wanted to do. And we got, we drifted so far at some point, Justin started a fashion company. And, and I'm, you know, look, I don't really even understand fashion. Um, but he's like, Kevin, I want you to do this with me. So we started this company called Saboteur on the side. And that's actually probably my internet debut video was we had a jacket called the Invincible which was waterproof, a waterproof blazer. It looked like a blazer, but it was waterproof. And I convinced him to go through a car wash and actually stand in the car wash, get beaten by these twirly things and sprayed with water. And we uploaded it to YouTube and got like, you know, five views. But we sold five jackets, so uh, that was great. Um, but that's how far we went. We went so far to something that we didn't even care about. I didn't even care about, right? Never had a passion for fashion. And we realized many of us were gamers. And we played games together. In fact, a lot of people joined because we were playing StarCraft Brood War late at night after work. And or I did anyway. Um, StarCraft II Beta comes out. We happened to get copies because we, we knew somebody that knew somebody. We weren't in the gaming industry yet. And we were playing so obsessively. Productivity was down, but we're watching everyone in the company. There was you know, nine of us at the time. Everyone's playing StarCraft II Beta all day. I'm like, hmm, there's probably something going on here. And we weren't just playing, we were watching videos on other platforms. We were watching on, on YouTube. On, at the time, there was you know, Ustream and Livestream. People were streaming. Um, the, sort of the top pro players were um, getting discovered there. And we were scratching our heads, like, why don't people love us? Why don't they use Justin TV? What's going on? And we built it. We, what did we do? We reached out to folks. We reached out into that sort of collective consciousness that was out there and said, hey, you guys are doing this. We want you to do it on our platform. What do we got to do? And they basically told us all these great things we needed to build. They wanted to be able to get discovered more easily. They wanted to be able to make money. They wanted things like transcoding so they didn't have to push multiple streams out. Um, so we built all those things. And sure enough, uh, they started to, to join us. And we were able to connect this global community um, around a shared passion of video games and around this really weird, unique live video experience that we're still learning about today. And what we realized was video is content, but chat is also content. So you know, flashback 2003, a lot of people were trying to append the social experience on top of traditional TV viewer, viewing, right? So the second screen experience, so to speak. And it never really worked. I mean, you were, it was still disjointed. It wasn't really, you know, you could talk about the content. And sure enough, people still do this, right? Every Game of Thrones, you avoid social media for the next couple of days if you missed it so that you don't get spoilers. That still happens, absolutely. But the difference here is communities are formed and new languages and memes are created. And this is you know, universal language. And not only that, chat is really part of the content. And I'll show you some videos so you'll see what I mean. But it's not only part of the content in that it is fundamentally interesting to watch side by side with the video. It actually influences the show. So a broadcaster might actually react to a question that happens in chat. A broadcaster might ask a question to the audience and get answers in chat. And otherwise, chat's sort of communicating with itself, its own little organism. And these things pervade the internet. So Twitch emotes is a big, big part of our culture. And the reason I, I, I bring this up is if you are effective as a content creator on the platform, your character and your, your lore, all the, all the stuff that pops up from your community really starts to pervade the internet. So we've got these emoticons that happen in chat all the time. They all represent something unique and interesting uh, as an emotion 
right? So this is Kappa. This is actually one of our interns from like 2007, 2008, uploaded this picture. Kappa was his, well, as the myth goes, Kappa was his fraternity. And it's just, we took this picture actually in alleyway. So we were over on 3rd and Townsend uh, on this alley called Clyde Street. Uh, pretty unsavory place to have an office, honestly. But uh, he took this picture outside, and it's just the most smug grin you'll ever see. Um, so for us, it represents that feeling of sarcasm, or that, that feeling of, 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 of being a joker, right? Um, and then Bible thump on the, on the left being sadness and, and, and uh, rage, baby rage, and so on. But these things have now pervaded. We've even seen these symbols on WWE in the audience. Like, we were you know, watching Monday Night Raw, and all of a sudden, you see this giant Kappa head in the audience. <laughs> And, and that's that power. So what is this content, really? So it's, it's user-generated content. Let's see what button do I need to push here. OK, so this is Trump. Trump is a Hearthstone player, Hearthstone's card game. And successful broadcasters, so the bulk of our content is UGC. There are some tournaments. There are shows like E3, industry events that we'll stream. There are some talk shows that you'll see pop up. Um, but the most common form of content is user-generated. So this is a guy. He's in, in, his, in his home studio streaming, playing Hearthstone talking with his audience. So when you see him look straight at the camera, he's really looking at chat. So right now, while you can't hear it, he's talking with the audience. But uh, what happens is chat will explode. All of a sudden, you'll see chat like roar, like a, almost like seeing them cheer in a physical space. And successful broadcasters really talk a lot about themselves. They can be entertaining. They can be humorous. They, they can be educational. They can be top of their field in their particular game. But really, the best broadcasters are all about that interpersonal relationship. How open do you feel? And more to the point, a lot of these folks are celebrities. You'll see them at industry events getting you know, followed by hordes and hordes of people waiting for a picture or an autograph. And just imagine, you know, compare this to sports or other celebrity, imagine if you could have ever watched Michael Jordan scrimmage and talk about the game, talk about his philosophy, talk about what he's learned and how he got where he is, talk about strategy, and maybe, just maybe, even play a game with the guy. And that happens all the time on Twitch. You get to play games with your favorite celebrities. So I started thinking about what, you know, how, to, how to communicate this interesting opportunity of, of, of this type, new form of media. Right? It's, it's live, it's video, it's, it's linear, it's, it's timed. Um, but it's interactive, and it's very strange. So this was a weird internet phenomena that is probably one of my favorites in all of history, not just because it's Twitch, just it's super weird. Um, this guy who will forever only be known as the creator. No one actually knows who he is. We believe him to be Australian. Plugged in uh, a Game Boy emulator with this game, Pokemon Red, which was made in, for original Game Boy in 1998, I think. And single player role playing game, role playing game, turn based, but you, you're moving around a map and you're encountering things. And the whole thesis around Pokemon is essentially you're fighting monsters and you're capturing them. And then when you capture them, they turn to your side and then you can use them to defeat further monsters and so on. And throughout it, um, the, the, the character runs into competing um, Pokemon masters who are trying to also capture uh, Pokemon and fight for you know, metals and shiny things. So at some point, uh, there were hundreds of thousands of people concurrently watching, but hundreds of thousands of people also concurrently contributing to the content. So the way it worked is, what the creator did was pull our chat into the emulator. So you could type up, down, left, right, B, A, select, start into chat, and it would command the person in the game, which this video doesn't show that, but just imagine a big board, and there's a character top-down view, and he's walking around. You're trying to roam through this world and, and finish the story and collect all these Pokemon. And it was absolute chaos. Uh, you know, 120,000 people contributing simultaneously to a single-player game, utter chaos. We're sitting there watching in the office being like, this will never. The, this is going to go on forever. Like, we've just ruined humanity. Like, hundreds of thousands of lives are lost. They're just going to be trying to finish this game that normally takes 20 hours. And through that, though, what we found were th this very temporary society was formed of people who were obsessed with completing the mission, with completing this game, which was completely arbitrary in, in its existence. And you see this evolution of culture s happening so quickly in this process. 16 days later, they, in fact, finished it. But what happened? It was so chaotic that eventually the creator said, look, this is never going to work. So we're going to form this new division called democracy. And you can vote for democracy. Otherwise, it's anarchy. But democracy had to be voted in by the user base by typing in democracy into chat. And it had to be a supermajority. But if the majority then re-voted, 
only majority, not supermajority, then anarchy came back. And so the anarchists were fighting the, Demo the, the, the democratists and all this crazy stuff was happening. And from there came this mythology. And so each group had its own sort of savior, its, its hero. And in the very beginning of the game, you select you know, Helix or Dome Fossil, and Helix was selected by the user base accidentally or randomly, and that became the symbol of hope and Dome sort of the enemy. Well, it depends on what side you're on. And throughout that, you're capturing Pokemon, and the way you're selecting names are com also completely chosen by chat. And so you see these like B, 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 J, 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 and one of the main characters became Bird Jesus. And Bird Jesus was fighting the good fight, or, or you think, and then eventually you run into other characters that, uh, that ended up being dubbed the Archangel and Jay Leno and uh, the False Prophet. False Prophet, Prophet ultimately was responsible for the release of, of Bird Jesus and other characters. Um, and throughout that, this mythology is created, and you're like, what's happening? And so there's a quick video summary of what happened. But the real point is you don't really know what to expect when you have live social video. And, and and sometimes this, this game, which was meant to be played by a single player back in the 90s, suddenly came back and was so fascinating that every campus in the Bay Area was showing it while it was happening, the 16 days. Everyone's watching it. It's this collaborative experience. People were jumping in their phone to type in a command just to feel what that was like. And what came from here was a new way to make games. And so now what you're seeing are people creating games with the concept of audience interaction. Now, Think of Hunger Games, this is the most obvious example. Imagine you're playing an open world first person shooter, there's 18 people on the field, and you as a fan, because everyone on the field is streaming, start to feel this personal connection. And I want to I wanna help this person. I, I, want, I want this person to succeed. I can spend money and I can... It, sorry, I was supposed to start to get to a little marketing, so I figured I'd cut it off. But the point is, this whole concept of Twitch plays. Um, is a new genre. So you're, you've got this Hunger Games game. Anybody can buy something. You can buy a health pack. You can buy a weapon pack for your favorite player to ensure that they succeed. And it's a whole different type of game development that you're only just starting to see. And so in, in thinking about this, you know, what, do we, what can we do for non, not games? We're at this weird intersection as a company where we're, we're a platform for gamers and, and game companies, but we're also an entertainment platform. And we struggle with that, actually, a lot. We struggle with how to think about that. How do we... How do we prioritize you know, platform versus content? Um, or how do we arm content creators with better tools? And so we decided to start experimenting. And we discovered that even non-live content works live. So Steve Aoki um, reached out. He's a gamer and decided that he wanted to stream one of his concerts from Pasha. And he had just launched an album. So a, a big part of that, as you'll see, is this, this music survey, which really links out to um, his iTunes buy page. And this was live. You could watch this video independently of anything and be like, oh, it's just a music video, cool. Like, I'm a big AOP fan, I'll just watch this. But this was happening live, and you'll see in chat what's going on. They're dancing right alongside the audience you see in Pasha. And that is crazy for that experience to translate into text. I mean, this set of emoticons, you still see all over the internet when people are like, oh, time to initiate dance party. Um, <laughs> And it's those types of things. So there's 126,000 people watching. There's probably 2,000 people in that venue. You're now extending this experience that is traditionally like very physical, hyper-local, into a global audience. And they're, they're taking that and turning it into their own very unique live experience. And then Bob Ross. Uh, so we love games. It'll always be our core. But we decided to start extending the platform into new verticals. Like, what are, what are the other possible content creators that might benefit from this live experience or might really enjoy this live experience? So who better than the OG professor of paint? And we talked to the, the rights holders and said, look, we really want to do this. We want to launch this section called Twitch Creative. And who better than the first guy who talked to an audience that wasn't even there in an incredibly low production value, just like our UGC content, set. And it changed, really, it kind of changed the world for a lot of our audience. Many of them never knew who Bob Ross even was. And what you see in chat is, so when, when each episode, this is the finale, six million people watch this, right? 30-year-old content, six million people watch this. Netflix eventually licensed the rights to Bob Ross for Netflix after this happened, because suddenly Bob Ross is relevant again. Like, who's this guy with the beautiful fro? And, and, 
so what, what's really funny is the type of the type of narrative, the type of storytelling, these like these fragments of story that are pieced together. I, I should talk a little bit more about how Pokemon work, but uh, the first touch of paint, the first time Bob touches his paintbrush to the canvas, everyone says ruined, and by the end he says they say saved, or, or you know things will happen where he'll be oh I'm about to paint a tree and it just looks like a I don't know looks like anything like a black line, and everyone's like what's going on. And then he'll fix it and they'll say saved. And sometimes his painting was so good that people would even take terminology means from games. VAC was one of them. VAC, VAC means Valve Anti-Cheat. When you're playing Counter-Strike, which is a first person shooter game, and someone's just crushing you so hard, you assume they're cheating. So everyone just says VAC. So people were saying that about Bob. And by the end, again, when you, when you, when you win a game in video games, when you're playing a multiplayer game, what do you say? GG, that means good game. So at the end of every episode, chat would just fly by GG. And of course, memes like the, 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 you know, they, that lent themselves from Bob Ross, like happy trees and, and yellow ochre and all these beautiful paint colors also pervaded the rest of the internet. Um, but what's really interesting is sort of just like this, just like Twitch Plays Pokemon, it's all these narrative fragments, right? And, and it, it travels around the world. Bob Ross was a seven day marathon every episode back to back. Twitch Plays Pokemon was 16 days. And when the US goes to sleep, Europe picks up the narrative. When Europe goes to sleep, Asia picks up the narrative, and then Australia picks up the narrative. So when the US wakes back up, they're like, hey, Aussies, what did you guys learn last night? And it all gets somehow mashed together in something that just somehow makes sense. So Bob Ross now, and, and, and many, many types of content that I think have potential for something like this, now means something to an entirely different generation, a generation that wasn't even considered when the show was produced. So how do you now create content that has that cross-generational capacity? And maybe you can't, but a platform when done right, can help, can help bring that to a new generation. So what does it all mean? Uh, we're still really trying to figure it out. Um, and, and, and you know, this the entrepreneurship is really like a, like a process of self-realization and, 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 and continual like evolution of your passions, right? And what I've been thinking a lot about is we would, we would love to see this type of content. Yes, yes, absolutely, we're a UGC platform by, by trade, by tradition. Uh, we're a gaming platform in the sense that we, we love games and, and gamers are our core audience. But these millions of people also love sci-fi. They love anime. They love Game of Thrones. They read comics, um, and so on. So I think the, what I'll leave you with is these last four thoughts. So customers, and you know, traditionally think about when you create content, it's customer base. It's really community, and that's what that's what we are. Twitch is one giant community organism, uh, and they're they're our foundation. They tell us what to build. They tell us what they want to watch. They tell us how to interact with them. And they speak through broadcasters, and broadcasters speak to us. Sometimes they speak directly to us, but they're beyond just fans. C community really is content. They're all content. It's not just the actual people that turn on their camera and speak to an audience and play games for them. They're all making content. So they're clipping videos. They're clipping images. They're taking these emoticons, and they're spreading them around the world. They're taking imagery that's formed from a particular broadcaster and turning it into further content. So what if? What if you could do that? What if we brought higher production value to the site? What, what, what would happen? I mean, we, we've had show premieres. We've had Silicon Valley premiere, Mr. Robot, um, these, these shows that really wanted to reach our audience and test it, and those went, went well. And we're, we're starting to see a, a few more things uh, happen there. But the other what if is what if you give our content creators your content? What if you give them IP? What if you give them characters to take and, and, and form new content with? And remember, it's not just, in this case, Unlike most digital video where it's a singular content creator, it is a horde. You are tapping into communities at a time. As micro as they might be, there are, they are in fact communities. It's a sort of collective unconscious that Rain was mentioning. What if you engage them in a different way to help you create content? Of course, that requires a lot of trust um, um, from, from you know, the original creator. Uh, but to wrap it up, I think really, the way I think about it is TV without restrictions. It's this global experience. Most importantly, you can engage a global audience at once. And that's one of our core philosophies. We want that global experience to be uh, continually relevant for everything that happens in the site. And it's participatory in, in, in two different ways, I guess, in the sense that it's participatory and interactive with chat. Um, but people sit down at the same time. Whatever happened to Saturday morning cartoons? Whatever happened to Nick at Night? Right? That type of programmed experience that I grew up with, I miss. I, I really do miss that a lot. I miss rushing home from school to make sure I caught Tailspin and DuckTales and Rescue Rangers. Animaniacs is still the best cartoon out there, I think, though. Um, so the other restrictions that you're missing are you know, global distribution. You get it immediately. 
Um, there's no time restriction. You can create a show as long as it needs. If you, had a, if you, if you schedule a show every Friday 7 o'clock, one week it could be 30 minutes, one week it could be an hour, one week it might just be one really epic battle that happens, and it only takes five minutes. But that's the thing that everyone takes away and talks about for the entire week. So as a storyteller, it gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, and then you don't have other restrictions like commercial break, language. Obviously, you don't want to create objectionable material or anything terribly unsavory. You want to create good content for an intelligent audience. But without those restrictions, what could you create? And that's what I leave you with. Thank you.